works in practice and then falls apart when you do it really. All right, so for those of you that don't know me, um, I've been in the travel industry for about 20 years now. Um, I'm currently working at the Indiana University Alumni Association and I manage the IU Travels program. And of course, needless to say, uh, we really haven't been anywhere in the past year um, as a program, but um, we're feeling cautiously optimistic about this coming summer. I've got a couple of trips going to Canada, uh, one to the Canadian Rockies and one to the Maritimes, uh, you know, Nova Scotia, New Brunswick, and those are starting to fill up. So I'm hopeful that those are going to happen. So here you can see a happy group. Um, I'm the one there in the, in the yellow. And one of the perks of my job is that a lot of our travel vendors um, send us off on what's called a FAM trip, a familiarization trip to um, sometimes uh, show us what a new program is going to look like uh, when launched. So um, I'm here with uh, travel directors from universities from around the United States and Canada. Uh, there's folks here from Purdue Naval Academy, Michigan State, uh, Queens University of Ontario, uh, University of Wisconsin, and University of Chicago, to name a few. And um, here again, you can see the wonderful group in front of uh, one of the many castles that you get to see when traveling through Ireland. And so, Ireland is an island of just over 32,600 square miles, making it close to the size of the state of Indiana. Uh, and Indiana is 35,900 square miles. And Ireland can be divided into two parts, as you can see on the map. Um, there's Northern Ireland, um, which is part of the United Kingdom. And then there's the Republic of Ireland, um, which is commonly known as Ireland. And that's what the focus of this presentation is going to be. And um, it covers 27,000 square miles of the island. The population of Ireland is 4.7 million and the population of Northern Ireland is 1.9 million, making the total population of the island 6.6 .6 million. Ireland was at the height of its population back in the late 1800s, 18, um, actually mid 1800s, 1845, with over 8 million inhabitants. And this was just prior to the Great Potato Famine. And um, you know, quite a, it lost more than 30% of its population, both to death and to migration to the United States um, in particular. Um, it has uh, a unitary parliamentary republic and it declared independence from the UK in 1919. And then the Anglo-Irish Treaty was implemented on December 6th of 1921. And next we're going to move to the um, Shannon Airport, which is the gateway into Ireland. And the airport has kind of a rich history. Um, it was the uh, gateway airport to Europe um, leading up to World War II. And um, it was the first airport that allowed transatlantic flights to happen. And that's where planes refueled coming from um, North America on their way into uh, the European continent. And uh, here you can see kind of a, a, an aerial view of the airport. And it also allowed uh, some Russian military planes to do refueling. They had to be uh, non-combatant, um, non-weaponized airplanes, but that uh, was allowed up until, I think it was the early 1990, the um, Soviet military transport. So they tried to keep um, this uh, airport very neutral for people to use. So Ennis is gonna be our first stop, and that's 19 miles from the Shannon Airport. It is Ireland's 14th largest um, town with a population of over just 25,000. So that kind of gives you a scope of how small some of these towns are. And there's kind of a close up of it. Oops, and I'm scrolling too fast. And there's uh, an aerial view of the town of Ennis. And Ennis means island in Irish, and it was given this name as it sits within the fork of the river Fergus. And there are two, there are a couple of different languages that are spoken um, in Ireland. Uh, English is the principal language at this point, and then there's Irish or otherwise known as Gaelic. 
And um, Gaelic is spoken by about just 6% of the population and there is fear that it's going to vanish. So one of the things that they've done is they've put both the English and the Gaelic name of streets on all of the street signs to try and get people to become familiar with the language again. So often when I'm traveling, I like to get up early before my travelers and go out and take early morning walks. And so I'm gonna show you some pictures from my early morning stroll of this really very colorful and very clean town. Of course, you can see a lot of the different um, pubs there in the streets and the beautiful hanging flower baskets. Took this tour back in April um, of 2017. And then of course the people, one of the things that you will find about the Irish people is that they are incredibly friendly. And uh, out on my morning walk, I had a lot of people come up and approach me and ask if I was an American and they wanted to know where I was from and wanted to know everything that, uh, you know, from politics to what it was like to live in Indiana and uh, things of that nature, but really, really friendly people, very hospitable. Again, you can see there's just no shortage of pubs all across the island. And one of the things that I love to do is shoot doorways and they just had some absolutely fantastic doorways throughout this town. And the other kind of intriguing thing that uh, I discovered during my walk is that there's this wonderful sculpture walk through the town of Venice and there are all different um, sculptures spread throughout the town. They were kind of interesting. And I think this was uh, established back in the 1990s. So Ennis likes to lay claim to Muhammad Ali, believe it or not. Um, as his grandfather, uh, Abe Grady was originally from Ennis. I found that kind of an interesting little tidbit um, about Ireland. So this is the, uh, you're looking at the um, Ennis Friary, locally known as the Ennis Abbey, and it was the Franciscan order, and it was established in the late 13th century, and today um, it lies in ruins, but remains a centerpiece um, and attraction for Ennis. Now, traditional Irish music um, began to develop in the 18th century and began to take a firm hold in the 19th century um, when ballad printers became established in Dublin. So this form of music has largely remained unchanged, um, primarily due to Ireland's agricultural background that supports oral traditions and the fact that Ireland was not a geographical battleground during world wars. Irish music is credited with influencing the bluegrass music of American um, Appalachia, an area predominantly set, settled by the Irish um, during the potato famine. And of course, Ennis has an annual tradition of Irish music competition for school students, and that was happening during our visit. So just about every pub that we walked into in um, you know, various buildings, we were treated to live music, which was absolutely wonderful to hear. Um, Now, Irish step dance um, has its roots in the 19th century. And that was a, we had several different demonstrations of that. And uh, traveling dance masters and uh, festival dancing were also seen while we were there. And of course, um, Irish step dance has been modernized starting in the late 20th century as showcased by the Show River Dance. And I don't know how many of you had a chance to see that, but I know it's been through the IU Auditorium um, at various times uh, in past years. So one of the first day trips that we took out of Ennis was to the area of um, Kong, and we're going to drive to Westport and Calmore Abbey um, going through Kong. And I'll kind of show you where that is in relation to Ennis being down here, and of course Kong's up here near Galway. And that's my dog that's snoring, if you can hear the snoring going on. And of course this is Kong proper. And during our visit um, in Kong, uh, this was the site, whoops, 
can't click too fast on this. Uh, this was the site for the filming of the 1952 Academy Award winning John Ford film, A Quiet Man, starring John Wayne and Maureen O'Hara. And here in town, there's a statue dedicated to the two of them with uh, John Wayne carrying Maureen O'Hara. And in the town, um, there's the Kong Abbey and it's a former uh, Augustinian Abbey. It now is, lies in ruins and it dates back to the 13th century. And uh, they have been described as featuring some of the finest example of medieval ecclesiastic architecture in Ireland um, within these ruins. These are some of the uh, images that I took within the Kong Abbey. So from Kong, we moved to Westport. And again, you can see the Kong is kind of in this area here and we're traveling north. To the city of Westport. And it's designated as a heritage town um, and is unusual in Ireland in that it's only a f uh, one of the few planned towns in the country. The design of the town is attributed to James Wyatt, an English architect, and has a population of 5,500. And um, our travel partner, AHI, uses this as one of its hubs for a trip that they call exploring the wild Atlantic way that goes up and down the um, western coast of Ireland. And so um, I kind of bring this up. Um, you see a lot of these different pub scenes and there must've been a good night at this pub. Those are all empty beer barrels sitting out uh, waiting to be picked up and exchanged for fresh ones. And I think you've had uh, Steve Raymer speak to you um, in the past, a friend of mine and former National Geographic photographer. Um, and uh, he teaches at the IU Media School. He's um, he just finished doing a book on the vanishing pubs. Um, and he, one of the places that he visited was uh, Northern Ireland. And he found, as did we, that the pubs, at least in Ireland, are flourishing in comparison to the pubs um, in the rest of the UK uh, because of the live music. Um, the live music continues to bring patrons into the pubs. So um, he definitely credits the music to doing that. So one of the pubs that we visited was Matt Malloy's, and uh, some of you may be familiar with Matt Malloy, and um, he's a current member of the traditional Irish music band called the Chieftains. And so this is a scene within, um, in his pub in Westport, where we were cheated to um, some live music. And of course, even the musicians get to drink. I, I will admit that this was probably at about noon when we were doing this. Of course, uh, there's the bartender. Um, the Chieftains started back in 1963 and Matt Malloy joined in 1979. And he plays the flute and the tin whistle in the music group. And of course, we were all treated to the celebratory pint of Guinness. And throughout their 50 year career, they have collaborated with musicians such as Bob Din Dylan, uh, James Galway, Art Garfunkel, the Rolling Stones, Van Morrison, and countless others. And they even allow their dogs in the pubs. And of course, um, they have been nominated 18 times for Grammy Awards. And uh, on display, there were a couple of those Grammys that they had actually won. Uh, they've won six. And so two of those are in Malay's pub. And of course, they let us uh, hold them, which I'm, I was shocked. So I got a chance to hold a, an actual Grammy. So now we're gonna move out of um, Westport and go to Crowpatrick. And so of course, uh, Westport's down here and we're headed again, I mean, Westport's right here and we're gonna head a little bit um, east. And there you can see Crowpatrick and it's a mountain um, within Ireland. And there is a monastery that sits on the top of it. So Crowpatrick or St. Patrick's uh, stack is a mountain that rises 2,507 feet above sea level. It's located just outside of Westport. 
And on the last Sunday in July, thousands of pilgrims climb Crow Patrick in honor of St. Patrick, who according to the tradition, fasted and prayed on the summit for 40 days in the year 441. Uh, masses are held at the summit where there is a small chapel that dates back to the fifth century. Now, some climb this mountain barefoot as an act of penance and carry out rounding rituals in which they pray while walking uh, sunwise around the features on the mountain. It is likely that the pilgrimage predates Christianity and was originally a ritual associated with the fe festival of Lundesad. So this is a picture of the National Famine Monument and the National Famine Monument, Monument sits at the base of Crowpatrick in Maersk County of Mayo. And it depicts a coffin ship with the skeletons and bones as rigging. It was sculpted by John Behan. It is Ireland's largest bronze sculpture. And the coffin ship was unveiled in 1997 to mark the 150th anniversary of the Irish famine. And there's another angle of it looking out towards the mountains. So now we're going to leave uh, Crowpatrick and the famine mountain, and we're going to head to a sheep herding demonstration. There's Crowpatrick uh, just off the center. And we're going to head into Lewisburg, where we're going to visit a, a sheep farm. And so while visiting the farm, we were given a demonstration on how um, even in modern times, dogs such as border collies are used to move sheep around farms. And so using a series of whistles, verbal commands and hand gestures, their hand, handlers can drive sheep around the pastures to a desired location. Uh, lamb sheep still play an important role in the Irish economy as a source of food, milk and wool for the textile industry. So there you can see the dogs. There's one chasing after the sheep. And they paint them. I think the um, you'll see uh, splotches of pink on some of them and splotches of blue. The pink are the females and the blue are the males. They can kind of keep track of who's doing what during mating season. And those dogs are incredibly adept at chasing these sheep around. And they even let us try. Um, a couple of people did eh, so so with the commands and the dogs to listen to them. one of the lambs. And then from there, we're gonna to head to a very famous uh, place that a lot of people visit when they go to Ireland and that's Kylemore Abbey. And Kylemore Abbey, an aerial view of it sits right here. And there's a satellite look down on it. And here is the kind of barren road leading to Kylemore Abbey. And you can see a couple of sheep um, standing there on the side. And yes, we did have to stop and wait for them to cross. Inevitably, if you're on a road, the sheep can tell when you're coming and they purposely wander out into the street. Now, as we passed, um, as we headed to Kylemore Abbey, we passed through Connemara National Park. And Connemara National Park was founded and opened to the public in 1980. And it features um, 2,957 hectares of mountains, bogs, heaths, grasslands, and forests. And there are many remnants of human civilization within the park. Uh, there's a 19th century graveyard, as well as a 4,000 year old megalith port tomb. And much of the land was once part of the Kylemore Abbey estate. So that gives you an idea of how huge these estates were um, in the past. There's a waterfall that we saw along the route with some people walking across the top of it. And just absolutely beautiful countryside. And this is Kylemore Abbey. So it was originally known as Kylemore Castle and it was constructed by a wealthy London doctor by the name of Mitchell Henry. And the construction of the castle took a hundred men four years to complete. It's 40,000 square feet with 71 rooms, including 33 bedrooms and four bathrooms. The walls range from two to three feet thick. And the castle was sold to the Duke and Duchess of Manchester in 1909. Uh, due to gambling debts, the Duke and Duchess were forced to sell to Irish 
Benedictine nuns in 1930 who managed it, who continue to manage it today as an active abbey in a school. Uh, there's a small cathedral on the ground and it's used by the abbey. And of course the abbey affords incredible views of the Connemara National Park. So next we uh, change hotels and locations and this is the uh, old ground hotel. Um, and the Limana Hall, which is part of the old ground hotel um, is contained in what appears to be an authentic medieval tower house. Uh, most of the original stone from the tower is now blocked by modern construction, but some of the remaining large limestone blocks are visible and form the wall on the main stairs um, to the function room. And we had a chance to have dinner in this area one evening. It's quite a room. Now we're back to Ennis um, at night. Had a chance to kind of wander around through Ennis and visit some of the pubs and listen to some music. So the next morning we moved to the Burren. And so I'll show you where the Burren is. So the Burn is a region of part of the National Park in County Clare, Ireland, and it covers uh, roughly 250 square kilometers and is primarily a karst landscape. Um, it has a very mild climate and it keeps the uh, soil temperatures higher than anywhere else on the island. And then of course we're looking at, um, I jumped a little bit ahead here, we're looking at uh, Within the near the Bur, uh, burn is the Kilfenor Cathedral, and it's uh, dedicated to Saint uh, Fachna, also known as Saint um, Fashanin or Saint Fachnin. And its uh, present st structure dates back between 1189 and 1200. It was built on the uh, so called transitional style with the nave and a channel in the cathedral. And of course, we had a chance to explore that in the cemetery. And there's a Celtic cross. Now we're moving on to the burn. Sorry about that, jumped ahead. My notes. This doesn't want to let me forward. There we go. And there it kind of gives you a sense of what the burn looks like from the air. It's just this big limestone kind of wasteland. And when you first arrive there, it doesn't look like a whole lot and you have to start to look really closely um, at what's going on there. And like I was saying earlier, it has a very, very mild climate um, that keeps the soil temperature much higher than the air temperature. And this region, um, unlike other parts of Ireland, supports Arctic, Mediterranean and Alpine plants, which is a very unusual combination in such a, a small area and they often grow side by side. And nearly 75% of the species of flowers that can be found in the burn um, often live in the crevices and rocks. And they have over 22 different species of orchids, including the early purple orchid pictured here. This is an alpine flower called the mountain avon. They also have over 24 different types of ferns. Again, many of these plants are very small. You have to look very closely to see them. But it's just a really unique, unique area. From there, we're moving on to the uh, Pullenborn Domen. And this is just outside of the Baron. And this that's a aerial view of the parking lot. And this is the structure seen from space that we're going to be looking at. And it's uh, called a, um, a portal tomb. 
And it contained, this area contains artifact of human history that date back to the Mesolithic period of 8,000 to 7,000 BC. And you've got two upright portal stones um, and they kind of suspend that big, huge rock there. And this uh, portal tomb is one of 70 tombs in the area that date back to the Neolithic period of around 4,000 BC. And so these uh, stones hold up a slab that's about 12 feet um, long and six feet off the ground, creating a chamber that's 30 feet deep, deep and the entrance faces north. And bodies near death or after death are placed beneath the portal, allowing their spirits to pass into the afterlife. So scattered remains found in and around the portal suggest that it was rare to live past 40 during this period. Many of the bones showed signs of arthritis. Um, teeth from the children shown signs of mal malnutrition and illness. So from um, here, we're, having, we're traveling to the Cliffs of Moher. And so I've got um, some images of the road from the burn heading to the Cliffs of Moher. Just shots of the countryside from the motor coach as we travel along. Those beautiful stone walls and narrow roads that sometimes is hard for a bus and a car to pass one another, especially in situations like this. So now we're arriving at the Cliffs of Moher one of the famous attractions in Ireland. And you can see there, uh, here's the parking lot where everyone parks and the cliffs kind of lie right along this area here. And you can walk all along this, this ridge line. So the Cliffs of Moher rise 390 feet above the Atlantic at Hag's Head at their southernmost point. And at O'Brien's Tower, pictured here, um, eight miles to the north of Hag's Head, Hag's Head and the midpoint of the cliffs, they reach their maximum height above the Atlantic at 702 feet. So they grow quite a bit um, from the beginning to the end. Um, O'Brien's Tower was built back in 1835. And there's the famous cliffs. And they take their name from an old promontory fort called the Mathar or Moher, which once stood on Hag's Head, um, the southernmost point of the cliffs, um, now the site of Moher Tower. The cliffs topped the list of Ireland's most visited tourist attraction by surpassing the 1 million annual visitor mark just recently. The cliffs consist mainly of beds of uh, Namurian shale and sandstone, with the oldest rocks being found at the bottom of the cliffs. It's possible to see 300 uh, million year old river channels cut through, um, forming unconformites at the base of the cliffs. And there are estimated 30,000 birds living on the cliffs, representing more than 20 species. And these include Arctic puffins, which live in large colonies at isolated parts of the cliffs. And on the other, um, on there's a small island off the coast called Goat Island, and they inhabit that um, as well. So it's a very important birding area. The cliffs have been featured in several films, including The Princess Bride and Harry Potter and the Half-Blood Prince. There's a couple more shots of us walking along. And one of the things that they warn you when you're walking on the path is to stay on the path. In many places, there's kind of a small stone wall and they encourage you not to climb over that stone wall uh, due to the high winds and eroding cliffs. Um, it was really, really windy. Um, before we got to the cliffs, uh, it was probably in the 60s, but the air temperature felt like somewhere between 30 and 40 when we got on, out on there with a huge wind gust. So you can see us bundled up on the cliffs. Just an absolutely spectacular, spectacular scenery. And then we're headed back to Ennis and we were, you can sort of see here a rainbow that we saw. You often see rainbows uh, throughout Ireland because of all of the rain that they receive, which is why it's so green all the time. 
And this is what happens when you try and cram 27 crazy travel planners all into one phone booth. Our, our guide had to think for trying to see how many people she could put into a phone booth. Of course, we've got a few of us on the outside of that. So the next day we left um, our hotel in Ennis and climbed aboard the Shannon Ferry. And we're going to cross the River Shannon um, right at its mouth and the ferry kind of uh, goes right across here. So the River Shannon is Ireland's largest and deepest river, um, making bridge construction very, very difficult. So um, this is why they have uh, ferries at different um, locations. And uh, the Shannon Ferry is about a 20 minute crossing from County Clare to County Kerry, and it's capable of transporting cars and buses and semi trucks. And so we move um, uh, from Ennis to the Dingle Peninsula. And the tip of the Dingle Peninsula is Ireland's and Europe's most western point. And then on the Dingle, Dingle uh, Peninsula, there's Connor Pass, and it's Ireland's highest mountain pass, and it's located uh, right along the Dingle Peninsula. And here you can kind of see where we're heading. This is the peninsula right here, and the pass is in this area. You can see it's very mountainous. Here you can see some of the scenes as we cross uh, through the mountains and over the pass out to the end of the uh, peninsula. And then if any of you are wondering what Tom Crean is up to, um, you can see here that there is a pub, the South Pole in. No, this is not our Tom Crean or our former Tom Crean, but we thought that was kind of, or at least I thought that was kind of funny when we were traveling past and I noticed this pub. So, One of the first things that we were able to see was the um, Skelligs, uh, Skellig Islands, once known as the Skellox, and they're two very small, steep and rocky islands um, lying about 13 kilometers west of Bolus Head on the uh, Irvine Peninsula in County Kerry, Ireland. And the larger of the two of the Skelligs is Skellig Michael, also known as the Great Skellig, and together with Little Skellig, um, they are the center of 900 acres of an important bird area established by Birdwatch Ireland in 2000. Skellig Michael is also famous um, for an early Christian monastery that is a UNESCO World Heritage Site. It um, was the final scene in Star Wars Force Awakens was shot on Skellig in July 2015, with additional filming taking place there in September 2015, and there was quite a bit of controversy um, allowing um, Disney and uh, Lucas Films in there to, because it was a UNESCO World Heritage Site, but they took great care not to disturb anything. Uh, the remains of the Skellig Michael Monastery appear in the film, representing an ancient Jedi temple. And we were told that the filming for, um, uh, for one of the final series back at that time uh, would be filmed there as well. And here we're moving along the cliffs. And so now we're moving to uh, Blasket Island in Cominol Beach. And the Cominol Beach is here, and that's Blasket Island right there. And that's uh, Cominol Beach. And the beach scene in the 1970 Academy Award winning film, Ryan's Daughter, starring Robert Mitchum and Sarah Miles, was filmed along this beach. And here's the one-way road uh, heading around uh, the side of the peninsula, which is quite a hairy ride. We were in and out of rainstorms all the way along it. Beautiful drive, glad I was not driving. Here you can see that beach. And the beautiful watercolors there um, at the beach. And some of this, all the stone walls and sheep dotting the landscape. And 
And so this is um, Blasket Island. And if you look very carefully, they call this the sleeping giant. So here is the forehead of a giant, the nose, its chin, its lips, and of course its uh, chest and belly and legs right there. So it looks like a, a giant's lying down. And we visited a museum honoring the people and the culture of remote Blasket Island who were evacuated in 1953 due to declining population and harsh conditions on the island. And so then we move on to Dingle, which is a very small town out towards the end of the peninsula. And it's the only established village on the entire peninsula. Population is roughly 2000. And of course, tourism is its principal um, industry. And one of its famous residents is Fungi, the, uh, the dolphin. And he's a bottlenose dolphin that has become one of the major attractions. And he's been living in the bay since 1983. So you can take uh, boat tours out to see him and some of his friends. And there's a statue dedicated to him. So Dingle has a rich history as being a trading port. Um, it was an important fishing port during the eight, early 1800s and fishing continues to be one of its major industries after tourism. Um, and then let's see here, this is St. Mary's Church out on the peninsula in Dingle. It's um, built in 1862. It's an example of neo-Gothic architecture some of the stained glass in the interior of it, beautiful church. And from the Dingle Peninsula, we are now going to move on to Killarney. And here's Killarney National Park and the city of Killarney. And we made a stop along the way in Killarney, Nas Killarney National Park to look out at one of the lakes in the mountainside. So absolutely beautiful preserve. And here is a map of the town. And so Killarney uh, is a town of approximately 14,000. It's on the shores of Loch Lean and Killarney National Park. And the town's roots date back to a monastery founded in the area around 640. And then here we head out to um, Ross Island. And so after a, a morning meeting, we were treated through a carriage ride through um, the National Park. That was kind of a surprise for us. Uh, our um, bus drivers uh, snuck away all of our luggage and they uh, then left and they told us that our motor coach had left and we were gonna be stranded there and they walked us outside and here were all these uh, handsome cabs waiting for us for our carriage ride. And our driver told us that he's, um, he's five generations of drivers in his family, uh, including his grandson. And it's a business that continues to be handed down from generation to generation. So the park encompasses over 25,000 acres. And it was, unique, it was named a UNESCO Biosphere Reserve in 1981. And the park is home to and protects Ireland's only herd of native, native reindeer, as well as the largest expanse of native, for, native forest land left in Ireland. And of course, this shows uh, Ross Island and Ross Cancel, Castle, which is a 15th century tower house and keep on the egg, edge of Loch Lean. And that's the keep. More images from along. Now we're going to leave Kilmarney and make a brief stop at the Longville House. And this is a manor house that um, our guests get a chance to spend an evening at um, during this tour. We just stopped there for lunch. 
Um, absolutely uh, beautiful place. It's, uh, it was built in 1720 and it's a stately Georgian country house. The home is owned uh, by direct descendants of the original owners in the O'Callaghan family. The current owners are William and Ainsley O'Callaghan and we had a chance to meet with them while we were um, uh, touring the place and both of them attended um, hotel management school. William is an established um, chef and Ainsley um, kind of uh, runs the estate. Um, William, all, all food is prepared for guests and is principally grown or raised or hunted on the estate. So, you know, there'll be some evenings that he'll go out and shoot some wild pheasant or wild game or um, butcher a pig. And of course they have wonderful gardens there where they'll pick uh, fresh fruits and vegetables. He also makes um, an artisan cider and a form of calidos from apples that are grown there on the property. So here are some shots of the interior of this home. Each one of the rooms that guests are, can stay in are different. It has all the wonderful amenities of the bar and big dining room, period furniture. We all wanted to stay. So from there, we move on to Dublin. And that'll be our final stop for the trip. Here you're starting to see close up of Dublin. And of course it's the capital of Ireland and uh, it's its largest city with 1.2 million inhabitants. It was originally founded as a Viking settlement um, and the kingdom of Dublin became Ireland's principal city following the Norman invasion. Uh, the city uh, expanded rapidly from the 17th century and was briefly the second largest city in the British Empire before the Acts of Union um, in 1800. And following the partition of the island in 1920, um, 1922, Dublin became the capital of the Irish Free State, later named Ireland. So the area of Dublin Bay has been inhabited by humans since prehistoric times but the writings of Ptolemy and Greco-Roman astronomer and cartographer in about 148 AD provide possible, um, possibly the earliest reference to a settlement here. So Dublin celebrated its official millennium in 1988, meaning that the Irish government recognized uh, 988 AD as the year in which the city was settled and that this first um, settlement would later become the city of Dub Dublin. So we're gonna visit the um, general post office. And this was the site of the Anne Post, the Irish um, post office and Dublin's principal post office. Um, it was the site of the Easter rising of 1916 and served as the headquarters for the uprising's leaders. And the building was destroyed in a fire during the uprising and all that remains is the original facade. Um, it now houses a wonderful museum dedicated to the 1916 uprising in Irish independence. And it's a revered symbol of Irish nationalism. So we had our farewell dinner here and we're treated to, it's in a large meeting room and we were treated to an operatic performance by two Irish sopranos. Beautiful music. So that is the end of my presentation. I'm happy to answer any questions about what you saw here. get yeah when we get back to gallery view raise your hand if you yeah and stop to share there yeah anybody have questions or go ahead Jean. bill how long a trip was this it kind of has a sense of if it's tuesday this must be belgium do you remember <laughs> well when when they when so what we saw here was actually the combination of two trips so keep in mind um this was a travel company um showing two new tours to a bunch of um travel directors so they hurried us through what would have been two weeks of travel in seven days wow. so that's why that feels a little bit rushed on what i showed you um each of the things that i showed you we would have been staying um much longer okay instead Beautiful. of scrambling around Beautiful. yeah Beautiful. Thank you. But yeah, that's, I guess that's one of the disadvantages of going on these fam trips. We don't 
we barely get a chance to sleep, let alone catch our breath. But it's wonderful. It gives us a chance to uh, see these places and then be able to talk about them with our prospective travelers. Go ahead, Tom. Tom. Bill, hey, Bill. It's more of a general question. Um, hey. I assume you've got trips scheduled again. And when do you when do they start? I mean, end of the year or 2022 or? So Two, a couple of tours that I have high hopes for um, are going to be in Canada. Uh, first one takes place, I think it's in late July, early August to the Canadian Rockies. And we just had uh, brochures drop for that and reservations have been pretty good. So I think it's something that, I don't know if it'll necessarily fill up. We tend to limit these tours to about 26 people. Um, but I do think this one's gonna be one of the first ones that go. We've got another one to the Canadian Maritimes. Um, so Nova Scotia, New Brunswick, that's doing fairly well. And one in October to go up and see polar bears, which has been one of my longtime favorite tours that I've done back in the, uh, in 1999, I went up there to see the bears. Um, that one's starting to fill up as well. Um, as far as trips to Europe, not yeah. sure. Really going to be dependent upon how the vaccines distributed yeah. there. Yeah. But I do think um, I do think we'll see European travel. I hope we've moved so many of our tours that were going to take place this spring and summer into September and October, and we're cautiously optimistic that some of those might operate. You you still have room on the polar bear trip. Yes, we do have room on the polar bear trip. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, I've been talking that one up. In fact, I'm, I've, I'm probably going to have to, I think we're going to postpone it until next year. But speaking of Ireland, we had a tour that was going to be um, hosted by Chancellor Ray Wallace. He's the Chancellor of IU Southeast um, down in New Albany. And he's from Ireland. Um, he's from Northern Ireland. And he was going to host that trip for us. And this will be the second time, unfortunately, due to the pandemic, we've had to postpone that, but I'm hoping we're gonna operate that one um, in 2022 because it was supposed to operate in July of this year. And I just don't think that's gonna happen. And I would, I'm would, i reluctant to push that off into the fall only because um, I just think that um, July would have been a great time to be there. Plus, you know, Ryan, you keeping a, a race schedule. Ryan? Yeah, um, are these open to the public? Uh, I'm sorry, I'm the new guy, so <laughs> I don't really have the context. Are you work through IU Alumni? Yeah, I work through the IU Alumni Association, and so we do open these tours to IU alumni and friends. So we do have folks that travel with us that are not um, alumni of the university. Good question, Ryan. I didn't Other know question. either, but my husband's yeah. alum, so maybe I'll glom on one of these. <laughs> yeah, but we do, um, you know, 50 to 60 trips a year, often hitting all seven continents. And they're everything from ocean going cruises on ships that range in size from 60 people up to about 1200, 1200 people is the largest ship that we'll sail on. Um, we use um, Oceana cruises and uh, Ponant cruises. Ponant's a French company that um, owns ships that are about 200 um, passengers. Oceana has ships that are 680 and 1200 passengers. And these are all slightly higher end cruises. And then we do river cruises all throughout Europe and um, other places. And then of course, land-based tours as well with some train trips mixed in. Say 50 or 60 trips a year? 50 to 60 trips a year. I don't go on all of them, <laughs> thankfully. I, I would never see my home. I have a, the counter, my counterpart at Texas A&M, um, she goes on most of her trips and they do even more than we do. And she's gone, I think she said about on average 250 days a year. Wow. And of course they're, um, they're traveling now. They've, they've been operating some trips during the pandemic. Most of them have been, well, all of them have been domestic, but um, and I think they have a, a different sense there of, <laughs> safety than we do, but it's Texas. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's Texas, but they, they've had several successful trips and to my knowledge, no one had contracted the virus on them. I'll make or, a note that it's one o'clock. If people, if anybody needs to okay. head off, feel free. Otherwise, um, other questions, anybody wants to stick around, Charlie. Oh, you're waving goodbye. Bye, Charlie. Bye, Ryan. I oh, thought you bye, bye, Charlie. For a question. Sorry. I have to go too, Bill. I enjoyed. Well, your good program. seeing everyone. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks, Bill.
Yeah, thank you, Tim. Yeah, thank you. Anything else for the good of the order? Thanks, Anything Bill. Else? It was lovely. Oh, you're welcome and always happy to do these uh, anytime you need somebody to speak. I think Brian wants to do one a quarter, so we'll look forward to seeing you in a little bit. Yes, thank you. Sounds good. Take care, everybody. Okay. All right, take care, everyone.